Hello everybody and welcome back to the Ozone. Today we are doing a, a read through of the, uh, the third story sorry, in Gumdrop Angel, which is the eighth Fast Bear Frights book. Um, and I'm so excited for this one. This one's called What We Found and uh, I, 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 I have a sense, I have a sense, I have a feeling this one is just going to be sensational. I have a feeling, it might be because it says Fast Bear's Fright horror attraction here, but I have a feeling this one's going to be amazing, it's going to have some lore reveals in it, and um, yeah, hopefully you will enjoy my audiobook, this is going to be the first time that I am reading through it, so uh, I'm sorry if I stumble a lot, but uh, that's the whole nature of these videos, if you don't like them then go listen to the official audiobook on Amazon, um, or get the book yourself and read it yourself. <laughs> so. Let's begin. Hudson leaned his gangly six feet, one inch, against the cr <laughs> Sorry, I had to laugh at that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Hudson leaned his ga I'm so immature. Gangly six feet, one inch, against the cracked brick archway just inside the newly constructed Fazbear's Fright Horror Attraction. The archway was only two weeks old, but it was made to look like the crumbling entrance to a place 30 plus years forgotten. There we go. 30 years. Hudson watched his buddies, Barry and Duan. Uh, Duan? Is that Duan? I, I think that's Duan. Um, sorry if it's wrong. Carry in the latest batch of Fazbear memorabilia for displays in the endless halls and rooms inside the building. The lobby was already piled high with opened and unopened cardboard boxes, each stuffed with vintage finds from various Freddy Fazbear's restaurants. Okay, this is very lore accurate already. Hudson was doing his best to stay away from the boxes, or not the boxes actually, but what was in the boxes. The management had dubbed them vintage finds, but as a couple of days ago, um, uh, as of a couple of days ago, Hudson was calling them something else. The boxes, as far as Hudson now was concerned, were full of old creepy stuff, and it was old creepy stuff that gave Hudson the heebie-jeebies, because he didn't believe it was just stuff. No matter how he tried to rationalise, the memorabilia made the little hairs on the back of his neck stand up stiffer than the needles his granny stuck in voodoo dolls. Hudson, think you could give us a hand? Barry asked. Hudson's buddies were struggling to keep a stack of boxes upright, but Hudson didn't move. I'm not part of the construction and setup crew, I'm the guard. Duane split spit on the linoleum floor. The disgusting blob of saliva landed right in the middle of one of the black squares, which, al which alternated with white squares to create a dizzying checkerboard pattern throughout the building. The floor gave Hudson a headache. The whole building was giving him a headache. How did something that had started so right now feel so wrong? I'm the guard. Do you, uh, sorry, I'm the guard, Duan mimicked Hudson in a whiny sing-song voice. You hear that, Barry? He thinks he's entitled or something. Hudson snorted. Yeah, right. I'm entitled to working double shifts, days and nights. You guys get to work days. Wine, wine, Duane said. This is the best job you've had in years. You said it yourself. The pay is great. Hudson nodded. That much was true, and he thought the job would have been even more than great pay to offer. But ever since, no, now it was just a job with crap hours, and he was tired at the time. Sure, but sleep deprivation tends to make you stop caring about great pay. I have to have some perks for holding the short end of the stick. One of those perks is getting to stand here and watch you two sweat. Fine, be like that, Duane said as he and Barry finally steadied all, of the top all but the top box in their stack. When that box fell, Barry managed to catch it. The box popped open while Barry grabbed it. A yellow furry arm flopped out. Hudson stiffened. Oh man, how he hated those character parts. They were the worst of the creepy old stuff for sure. Barry set down the box. Duane pulled out the arm, then reached in and grabbed the second arm. Check this one out, he said. He held up the second arm and looked at what it held. What the heck is that? Barry asked. I think it's a cupcake, Duane said. Not a cupcake I'd want to eat, Barry said. Look at those teeth. Duane started... Uh, towards Hudson with the two arms pretending to be a fuzzy yellowed arm zombie. He made guttural groaning sounds as he staggered across the room. Hudson held his ground and pretended to be bored, but the truth was that he wanted to scream and run. 
The disembodied arms were bad enough, but the cupcake was just disturbing. Hudson pulled out his nightstick from the loop on his belt. He made like he was going to have a sword fight with Duan Zombie. He thought he was doing a pretty good job of acting playful and relaxed, and he hoped Duan didn't see the sheen of sweat on his forehead or smell the pungent scent that was starting to emanate from under his arms. Wait, what that... Was that smell his, or was it coming from the disembodied arms? Cut it out, you two, Barry said. How old are you? 23, Duan said. Same as you. Are you having memory lapses in your old age? Then he laughed and returned the arms to the open box. Barry and Duan left the building to return to the truck for another load. Hudson strolled nonchalantly down the hall until they were out of sight. Then he strode to the office, the real office. There... He went in and shut and locked the door. Dropping into the cheap, wobbly desk chair in front of a bank of monitors, Hudson surveyed the building, starting with a fake office. Fazbear's Frights was being set up to be a sort of expanded replica of the Freddy Fazbear's restaurants. Not a true representation of any one of the actual old places, this attraction spliced together aspects of the infamous pizzerias with all the murderous history. The office was one of those aspects, the place where hapless security guards like Hudson managed to miss seeing the tragedy as it unfolded so many years ago. The fake office had already been decorated by the attraction's design team. They'd done a good job of making the room look old and dingy, and dingy mostly because they were able to use salvaged re, uh, derelict Sorry, derelict equipment original to the old pizzerias. There's, there's just so many words I don't understand in this. <laughs> um, I think I get it though. Uh, clunky monitors, dusty keyboards, bent filing cabinets, and a scratched desk had been shelved into the room. Hang on a second. Is that from the FNAF 1 location? Because I believe um, if, if you, in FNAF VR, if you look behind you, in the FNAF 1 location, there's like loads of filing cabinets. There's obviously monitors and keyboards and scratch desk makes sense. <coughs> Sorry. Um, then they covered those surfaces with piles of paper, wadded up trash, paper cups, and a crooked old fan that squeaked as it ran. It's definitely stuff from, FNAF, well, from the FNAF 1 location. They even let loose a rat or two in the room. The rats apparently were pretty tame and had a place to stay, tucked into a vent in the wall when they didn't want to perform. But when they scurried around, they gave Hudson the willies. He figured more than one girl would scream her head off when the rats appeared. Hudson had nearly screamed himself a couple of times. He wasn't a fan of rats, and speaking of the vent, it was one of the small functional vents for the heating and cooling system. Higher up on the wall, huge louvered vent covers made it clear the vents behind him were massive, certainly large enough to accommodate a good-sized man, or something not so ordinary. Hudson, who was school but tin uh, tall but skinny, sorry, could have easily had a picnic inside one of those vents if he was so inclined, which he wasn't. What in the heck were those big vents for? Hudson had asked the question, and he hadn't received an answer. That unsettled him. He didn't think the vents were for anything good. Hudson noticed movement on the monitors, and he leaned back in his chair to watch Barry and Duan carry in another load. Both men were laughing. And why shouldn't they laugh? Barry and Duan had, made, had it made. Unlike Hudson, they were good-looking, respected around town, and on the verge of, get, of going into the Navy to train for a spot on a SEAL team, an S-E-A-L team. Uh, when Hudson, Barry, and Duan were boys, they were the three musketeers, ready to take on the world, invincible, unstoppable. Hudson could remember the swashbuckling fights they had in their backyards, reenacting scenes from their favourite action movies. They didn't have a care in the world. But that was before Hudson's dad died and his mum married Lewis, a ridiculous balding man who wore plaid vests and smoked a pipe like he was giving a performance every time he took a puff from it. To this day, Hudson couldn't stand the smell of cherries because Lewis had used black cherry pipe tobacco. This horrible little man Hudson's mother thought it would be a good idea to marry would make Hudson's next ten years a living hell. The day his crazy mother said I do to Lewis was the day life started saying I don't to Hudson. 
It was also the day when his life path and that of his best friend started to diverge. Sure, they all remained friends. They still had fake sword fights. They still hung out. But everything else changed. Barry and Yuan did well in school, so their parents were proud of them. And they did well in sports, so they were popular with the older kids. With the other kids, sorry. Uh, while their stars were on the rise, Hudson began to screw up in class, a product of spending the night in fear that his stepfather was going to bust into his room and beat him just for the fun of it. Sore because of the near daily be beatings and malnourished because his mum started taking pills to get it through the day and therefore forgot to do the mundane things like grocery shop. Hudson couldn't get on a baseball or football team to save his life. Barry, whose red hair and freckles had been awkward when he was young, became an auburn-haired novelty to the cheerleaders and fans alike in high school. Duan, who wore tight black shirts to show off his muscles and grew his black hair long enough to, wait, to wear in a glossy ponytail, was like walking catnip to school to girls. Even though Barry and Duan still tried to include Hudson, there was no place for him, really, in their world. And so it went, year after year, until the night of the fire. And then, just when he was sure his troubles were over and the sun was finally going to rise again in his life, things just got worse. To have that happen again here, in his new job, it wasn't fair. Pounding on the office door jerked Hus Hudson from his pathetic stroll down Memory Hill. Sorry, Memory Hell. <laughs> I keep getting like tiny words mixed up. I don't know how. I'm sorry. Uh, he scrambled upright. What? He shouted. We're going to knock off and go to Charlie's for a Sunday in 15 minutes. Wait, Charlie's? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> this is where we're going, is it? Um, coming with? Hudson looked at his old scuffed watch. That would work. He got six hours off between shifts, just enough time to get ice cream, go home, eat canned soup, then try and sleep for four hours. What a life. Sure, he called. Meet us out front. Okay. Hudson sighed and stood. He had to do one more walkthrough before he passed the keys to Virgil, the old guy who covered for him when he went home. Hudson was pretty sure... I'm pretty sure it's Virgil or Virgil. I'm going, to call, I'm going to call him Jill. I'm going to call him Jill. Uh, Hudson was pretty sure Jill didn't do a thing but sleep while he was here. But Jill wasn't Hudson's responsibility. Hudson just wanted to do a good job on his shift so he could keep the better pay coming in. It wasn't like he had a lot of job options available. That thought made him grind his teeth. Thanks, Lewis, he muttered as he left the office. In the hallway, he took a deep breath and gave himself a little mental pep talk about what he had to do. This is not rocket science, he thought, nor is it an advance into enemy territory, a fight with deadly demons, or a descent into hell. It's just a tour through a building that has a lot of old creepy stuff. When the goosebumps popped up on his forearms, he knew his unusual, sorry, he knew his usual pep talk had failed. No amount of reasonable assurances could make a dent in his new utterly illogical fear of this place. Hudson put a hand on his nightstick and began whistling as he headed away from the office. He made sure to stay in the middle of the hall as he walked toward his least favourite part of the building. He stayed in the middle because the, hall the walls of the hallway were already decorated. The entire interior of Fazbear's Frights, although in a new brand in a brand new building, oh my gosh, how did I mix that up? In a brand new building, had been made to look like a long, abandoned space. Already dark and gloomy because it was nearly windowless, only the tiniest of windows were set up high on the walls. Um, the rooms and hallways looked ancient because p uh, painters had used all sorts of weird techniques to create walls that looked dirty, mildewed and cobwebbed covered. As if that wasn't bad enough, the designers had begun covering the mottled walls with decayed, time-ravaged bits of Fazbear characters, hanging in netting or from strings, sometimes nailed to or impaled on the wall by knives. The hallway walls were lined with parts of old Fazbear character suits and animatronic parts like wires and joints. The main attractions were the whole costume heads of three of the characters, Freddy, Foxy and Chica. 
These had, where, where's Bonnie? Where's Bonnie boy? <laughs> uh, these had positions of prominence in the hallway, but interspersed uh, with them were a cornucopia, cornucopia <laughs> of character pieces. Bunny ears, there we go. Bear paws, chick feet, fox snouts, fuzzy purple bellies, matted furry brown legs. There were just a few of the spine-chilling slices of Fazbear lore that waited in the hallway to startle unsuspecting passers-by, or to grab them. Hudson had heard that the, that the designers were working on animating several of the hands. It wasn't functional yet, but once Hudson's arm had brushed a purple bunny hand as he went by, and he'd beaten the hand into the ground before he realised he was pummeling an inanimate object. Luckily, he'd been able to reattach the hand to the wall, and apparently the designers hadn't remembered the hand wasn't that, that mangled when they'd put it up. Interspersed with the character parts, images of pizzas and children's drawings created a feeling of disorientation. So did the thick, torn electric cables dangling from various parts of the ceiling. They looked like headless black snakes. They weren't live electric cables, of course. At least... Hudson assumed they weren't. He wasn't about to touch one and find out. At the end of the hall, Hudson sighed in relief and then set his shoulders before he stepped into his least favourite room in the building, the dining room. He always checked this room first to get it out of the way. When he was hired, Hudson thought this was going to be a great gig. Yeah, the hours sucked, but, it, but not only was the pay great, the job also came with the chance to get to know the lovely dark-haired petite girl who was going to art school and working here part-time with the design crew. Faith, she even had a lovely name, was every bit as nice as she was pretty, and she knew and she was new in town. This meant she didn't know Hudson's history, which also meant that she didn't hate him on sight, and that meant she actually laughed and joked with him as she flitted about tucking the old bits of animatronic parts in with old Fazbear plates and cups and party hats on long tables covered with torn purple tablecloths. As Hudson had helped Faith carry boxes all over the building, Faith had told him about her little sister and her dog, Goose, a spaniel, a bird dog that was afraid of geese. Hudson had loitered nearby while Faith painted sets all over the building, and she had told him about her car, Bettina, a classic MGB that she spent her weekends working on. You know engines? She, he'd asked her, thinking for sure she was the perfect woman. Do I know engines? Faith had laughed. I could buy you one. Hudson had grinned at her like an idiot. Faith laughed harder. I also like sports. She stopped um, laughing and smiled at him. I like you too. So why haven't you asked me out? After he'd blushed redder than the fake blood Faith was painting the walls with, he asked her out. They went out for a pizza. He thought he'd died and gone to heaven. But it was too good to be true. Hudson barely waited five hours before calling Faith to ask her out on a second date. But that was too long. In that five hours, somehow, Faith had heard about him. When she answered his call, she'd asked, Did you do it? All the good feelings he'd had about her drained from his body like someone had turned a valve that emptied joy out through his big toe. He was pissed. Why do people always have to ask him that question? What do you think? He snapped. Faith was quiet for a few seconds. Then she said, I think we should be more professional on the job. I'm confused. Have, do, we, do we know what he's done? I'm assuming we, ha we don't know what he's done yet. But I heard something about a fire before, so I'm a little bit... Yeah, I'm confused on that. <laughs> um, Hudson didn't even respond. He just hung up the phone. Ever since then... The job had gotten on his nerves, and so had the building and everything in it. Now, as he stood in the dining room Faith had designed, he wondered at the ghostly jump scares and grisly reminders of old crimes never quite forgotten. Where did she get off judging him for something he might or might not have done? Her mind was clearly twisted. How else could she have come up with the idea of a door opening and a hand reaching in to drag a little boy out of sight? Hudson stared at that feature of the dining room, then ran his gaze over the place settings on the table and the animatronic parts placed in bizarre positions on the chairs. He studied the statues on the stage, created to look like the original animatronic 
animal performers that used to sing and entertain at the original Freddy Fazbear's restaurants. The statues were, unlike their inspiration, completely non-functional. They couldn't move on their own. So why did Hudson always feel like they were watching him? Ooh. <laughs> Hudson left the dining room and went through an archway into the arcade area. Although calling it an arcade area didn't really describe it. It looked more like an arcade junkyard. Hudson thought the management had exhumed every old, broken, dirty, cobweb-covered arcade game that used to lie in a landfill to bring them here. Hudson had seen an actual worm crawl out of one of the pinball machines the day before. Beyond this game cemetery, a pile of rotting prizes cascaded out into the adjoining hall. Some of the prizes were in morbidly um, wrapped packages, think bloodstains and images of bones mixed with characters' eyes and teeth, some looking every bit as decrepit. De it's this word, I, I don't get this word, as decrepit as de decrepit, <laughs> some looking every bit as decrepit as the arcade games, were li lying loose on a broken dusty counter or on the floor in piles. These prizes could no longer be called prizes. They were more like punishments. Maybe he'd be allowed to hand them out to kids who didn't behave themselves when the place opened. Hudson, eyeing a headless baby doll, grinned. He would find a sick uh, he would find a sick sort of enjoyment in handing out hideous gifts to kids. Kids were nearly always mean to him. Maybe he could get a little payback. Chuckling, Hudson turned away from the prizes. He continued on his last security tour of this shift. He turned down one long hall and then headed up another, took side steps into fake storage, wardrobe and supply closets, switched back through the replica of a pizzeria kitchen, complete with working industrial sized ovens so Big Hudson would fit inside them, until at last he completed his rounds. He ended up near the building's lobby, there he stepped into the bathrooms, first the men's and then the women's. He tried to avoid glancing in any of the mirrors when he was inside the ridiculously bright red spaces. Hudson didn't like looking at himself. It wasn't that he looked bad. He figured he, was, he looked pretty normal. Short blonde hair, three days growth of a pale beard, blue eyes, a wide mouth full of straight white teeth. These weren't features to be avoided. But to Hudson, these, featured, these features added up to one thing he never wanted to face, himself. Facing himself meant facing his past. He could only manage that in snippets. Stepping out of the women's restroom, Hudson paused near the gift shop that sold an amazing assortment of Fazbear merchandise. The store had a little of everything Fazbear related. The animatronics were no longer in one piece and functioning, but their images were displayed on hundreds of items. Visitors were going to be able to buy plush toys, action figures, clothing and accessories like Chica hairbands and Freddy hats, housewares that included sheets and towels, artworks, sporting goods and greeting cards based on the old characters. The gift shop was about three-fourths of the way stocked, and he knew it was supposed to be a bright and cheery place with its red and yellow striped walls and its colourful posters of the Fazbear characters, but he thought the rows and rows of little eyes on the plush toys and action figures were anything but cheerful. He thought the hundreds of small characters looked like they were lining up for an invasion of some kind. He didn't want to be around when that invasion came. He knew from horrific personal experience that toys could turn from fun to instruments of torture in a heartbeat. Of course, that required... There you are, Duan called. You ready to go? Hudson looked out of the front door of Fazbear's Fright and spotted Virgil getting out of his 30-year-old 30, 30 Ford sedan. Hudson nodded, ready. He couldn't wait to get out of here, even if it was just for a few hours. Since they were kids, Hudson and his friends had been going to Charlie's, an old-fashioned soda fountain and ice cream parlour on the other side of town. Thank God! <laughs> Thank God it's not actually uh, Charlie. <laughs> um, where, where are we? Yeah. Although they should have outgrown the place a long time ago, they all liked going back to it from time to time. Not just for the ice cream, but for the reminder of an innocent time they had all left behind. Well, at least Hudson and Barry had left it all behind. 
Hudson wasn't sure about Duan, and it was usually Duan's idea to come here. Hudson liked the place, but he didn't like going to the far side of town. It meant he had to bum a ride from his friends, and he'd have to bum a ride back. It sucked having no car. It sucked having no life. Hudson and his friends arrived in the narrow, dimly lit, wood panel. Oh my gosh, wood panelled parlour filled with red leather stools and booths. Hudson surveyed the scene. This place is starting to look a little like Fazbear's frights. It needs a good cleaning. Duan slid into a booth and stretched out his legs. Who cares? Doesn't this place make you feel like a kid again? Barry and Hudson squeezed in opposite Duan. But Barry snorted. It would take more than an ice cream parlour to make me feel like a kid. And you? What do you mean, again? We're all still waiting on you to grow up. Duan grinned. You say, that, you say that like it's a bad thing. The small ice cream parlour only had a couple other customers, a teenage couple sharing a float. As they sucked their concoction through a straw, they stared into each other's eyes. Hudson glanced at them, then fixed his gaze on the chrome jukebox on the black and white checkerboard floor at the far end of the room. It was way too similar to the one at Fazbear's Fries to suit Hudson. Zoning out, he reflected on his younger self, trying to remember the last time he'd felt truly happy. It was weird. He could perfectly envision his pre-Lewis days in mind, but he couldn't feel them. It was like watching some other kid's life on a movie screen in his head. Sighing, he drew a deep breath. The room smelled like dust and furniture polish. Only a hint of sweeter scents like vanilla and cherries managed to get through to his nostrils. Barkeep, uh, Duan bellowed, three of your finest. The guy behind the soda fountain wasn't one they recognised. He was muscular and had a buzz cut. He rolled his eyes at Duan. Okay, now a little birdie has told me that it's not actually Duan. <laughs> so I'm really sorry for pronouncing it like that. Um... For, for for the past 20 minutes or whatever um it is actually Duane which makes a lot of sense so i'm, I'm going to call him i'm going to call him Duane from now on Duane laughed oh all right three chocolate sundays hold the cherries hudson leaned back and half listened to Duane and Barry talk about the day while he watched the sundays being made when the sundays arrived Duane and Barry argued over the bill hudson noticed neither of his friends asked him to pay not that he could have after he paid his rent and utilities this month, he'd have exactly $123.67 left to buy groceries and pay for bus fare to and from his job. Better pay was a relative thing. He was still poor. If only the Navy had wanted him like it had wanted his friends. Of course, it hasn't. How could he hope to pass a physical? He had two fused discs in his spine, left over from when Lewis threw him against the wall after he mouthed off to him. He had a wrist that gave him fits. It hadn't been set right after Lewis crushed, uh, crushed it under his boot because Hudson wet himself during a thunderstorm, not to mention the nerve injury. He was damaged goods, barely able to walk the spooky halls of Fazbear's Frights. I shouldn't be eating this, Barry said, digging up his spoon into whipped cream. Uh, chocolate syrup and vanilla ice cream. Dinner at my grandparents' house this evening. Chicken fried steak and white gravy, mashed potatoes and creamed corn. Duane, uh, Duane asked, sorry. Uh, what else? Gotta love grandmas, Duane said, spooning ice cream into his mouth. The rich aroma of chocolate cut through the dust and polish smells. You got that right, Barry agreed. Yours does that incredible apple pie, right? Duane nodded, and cinnamon rolls. Thankfully, she only visits a couple times a year. I'd be a tubby if she lived close like yours. How's your granny, Hud? Barry asked. You haven't mentioned her in years. Is she still alive? Hudson nodded and grinned. I don't think she can die. Duane nudged Barry. You remember how afraid you were of her when we, ha when we were kids? Barry held up his hands. Hey, I'm not ashamed. He looked at Hudson. What reasonable person wouldn't be afraid of your granny? <laughs> he laughed. Hudson smiled and nodded. Only an idiot would cross her. Duane grinned. Remember when she made that voodoo doll of Mr. Pike's staff? He laughed. The jerk walked funny for a week, and she only used two pins. Hudson smiled again. 
His granny was not your run-of-the-mill grandma. That was a good one, he admitted. But I've always thought granny was more wise and scary. She's always known stuff. He thought about how creeped out he'd been feeling at Fazbear's frights. Like she always told me, that if the hair stands up long on the back of your neck, you should do what it wants and stay alert because trouble's coming. Duane laughed. So, what's the hair's got... So, what's the... Oh my gosh. So, what's got the hairs on the back of your neck standing up? Hudson looked at him. For real. You want to know? Duane said. For real. Hudson didn't speak. Instead, he thought about his granny. An expert in the use of herbs to heal whatever needed healing. Granny Foster was a seer who claimed to know the future, but never bothered to tell anyone else about it. She didn't have any particular faith or belief system, including voodoo, but she thought voodoo dolls were a hoot, and she liked using them to mete out justice to unpleasant people. Why, Granny? 12-year-old Hudson asked her once. Why do they work for you, when you don't even believe in voodoo? Granny Foster, who always wore big men's plaid flannel shirts with baggy jeans, rocked in her chair on her front porch and said, I believe in what I believe and because I believe it, it works for me. I don't know what that means, Hudson said. You don't know what to believe. That's why life knocks you around the way it does. Granny Foster had a lot of uh, pithy pronouncements like that and Hudson had spent years thinking about every single one of them. It was one of the reasons he was so edgy at work. Earth to HUD, Duane said. Hudson blinked. Sorry, he took a bite of his ice cream. Okay, what makes my neck hair stand up is Fazbear's frights. Duane laughed. Really? That place? There's nothing hair-raising about it. It's just smoke and mirrors for schmoes and who think being artificially scared is a good idea. Like there isn't enough real scary stuff in life to keep us busy, Barry grunted. Exactly, Duane said. Fazbear's Frights is, a, is just a place to work, it's a job, a short stop along the road. Maybe for you, Hudson sighed. You're not stuck here. Duane scooped up more ice cream and didn't respond, but Barry said to Duane, he has a point. Duane shook his head. You can't think that way, Hud. You have to believe things will break for you. Things break all right, Hudson said, thinking about his attempt to date Faith. I mean, break in a good way, Duane said. I know what you mean. Barry and Duane dropped Hudson off at his basement studio apartment four hours before he had to catch the bus to get back on the job. A little drowsy and a lot hungry, Duane put a can of chicken noodle soup on the tiny stove to heat. While he waited for it, he stared at the noodles and thought about his mum, the way she was before Lewis came into their lives, before Hudson's dad had died. She'd never been a particularly warm and fuzzy mum, but... She'd been efficient and responsible until her husband was gone. Hudson's dad, Stephen, had been one of those dads every kid wanted. Always up for throwing the ball, playing a game or just rough housing. Hudson's dad was fun and attentive. Unfortunately, he also struggled with mental illness for many years. For every happy, high-flying adventure his father had taken him on, there were many more invisible low points that he'd hidden. When Stephen got himself into a bad deal that cost him his small business, and thus his family's livelihood, he'd taken his life. Over the years, Hudson had vac vacillated between loving his dad for the childhood memories they'd shared and hating him for leaving Hudson and his mom alone and destitute, easy prey for a monster like Lewis. Hudson also spent a lot of time asking himself if he was prone to the same bad luck as his dad. Maybe he was, or maybe he just let his dad's fate seal his own. Hudson wasn't sure what had happened, but for some reason after his dad was gone, everything went wrong. It wasn't just about Lewis or about Hudson's weak, checked-out mum. It was everything. Suddenly, for instance, he became a target for the worst bullies at school. He was locked into supply closets before class and chased home after the last bell rang. He was pushed, shoved, punched, and almost drowned when his head was held in a flushing toilet. That happened more than once. One of the bullies called him Swirly Head. The teachers at school weren't much better than the bullies. When Hudson's grades started dropping, no one stepped up to help him. No one wanted to know why his grades were going south. They just wanted to yell at him for not keeping up. One, Mr. Atkin, a tough algebra teacher, even called Hudson stupid in front of the class. And the sad thing was 
that school was the easy part of his life. Home was much, much worse. Lewis had a daily reminder for Hudson, you're nothing. The word nothing was alternated between beatings, you're nothing, slap, you're less than nothing, punch, you're smoke. Now, there was some irony, given what eventually happened. Granny Foster liked to say that heat and fire purged, and she was right, sort of. When his family's house burned down at the end of his senior year, it purged Hudson of Lewis and his mother. But it didn't purge his torment, that just worsened. The problem was that the fire investigators concluded the fire wasn't a natural fire, given Lewis's known violent proclivities. Hudson thought the police would immediately suspect his late stepfather of the crime. Instead, they turned their eyes on the stepson Lewis knocked around. For five years, Hudson had been free of Lewis, his mother and his teachers. But while Duane and Barry had been away at college, he'd gone from one dead-end, boring job to another because he couldn't shake the stigma of being a suspect in an arson or murder. When his friends got back... Oh, hang on. Barry had been away from college, he'd gone on one dead end, boring job to another because he couldn't shake the stigma of being a suspect in an arson slash murder. So I'm assuming there was a fire before and these guys were all like a uh, suspect for it. Huh. When his friends got back, they started taking high paying temporary jobs in construction or whatever, basically just having a good time for a bit before they had to get serious about life. Hudson had been a clerk at a local convenience store for the previous six months until Duane and Barry talked him into applying to Fazbear's Frights. The idea was the three of them would hang out together at Fazbear's for a few weeks and then join the Navy. A fine idea, if Hudson hadn't been battered into worthlessness. Hudson took a deep breath and noticed the smell of something burning. He looked down. The soup broth had boiled away, and now the chicken and noodles were blackened and stuck to the bottom of the pan. Hudson snatched up the pan and threw it in the sink. Smoke filled the air and stung his eyes. How long had he been standing there feeling sorry for himself? He looked at his watch. Too long. Sighing, Hudson ran water in the pan and got out a scrub brush. After cleaning up, making a new can of soup and eating, he'd only have three hours to try to sleep before he had, had to get back to work. Virgo was waiting just outside the gift shop when Hudson got back to Fazbear's Frights. Any issues? Hudson asked Virgil. Not unless you call this place's busted thermostat an issue, Virgil said. Hudson shook his head. The building never felt cold to him. You need to get your wife to knit you a thicker sweater. Virgil tugged at the threadbare cardigan he wore. Nah, I like this one. It's comfortable. Hudson nodded and then waved goodbye to Virgil as he shuffled out the front doors. As soon as he was out, Hudson locked the doors, turning to face the building. Uh, Hudson listened to the silence that surrounded him. Weirdly, the silence seemed to move around him like a living, breathing entity. It seemed to have layers, nuances, <laughs> oh god, uh, that is not how you say it, is it? Uh, that contained information he didn't understand. No, not just information, threats. The silence felt like a threat, like a promise of something unpleasant to come. Hudson pressed his back against the closed door and tried to control his quickening breath. He resisted the temptation to un unlock the door and run out into the night. Somewhere in the guts of the building, something thumped. Hudson drew his nightstick. Then he laughed at himself when he felt cool air pouring from the nearest floor vent. The sound he'd heard was just the cooling system cycling on. You need to get a grip, he told himself. He took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Then, keeping his nightstick in his grip, he set out on his rounds. Darkness stretched out ahead of Hudson as he walked in his usual route. The building's lights were set to dim after midnight, causing the boxes stacked in the corridors to cast unusual shadows. Memorabilia that had been unpacked through shorter, fatter shades that reminded Hudson of the rats in the fake office. When one shadow seemed to shift, he pulled his flashlight and shined a beam on the area, wondering if one of the rats had gotten out of the office. Or maybe they'd brought in more rats. He wouldn't put it past them. After three weeks of keeping an eye on the place while it was being prepared for the public, he was getting used to the rapidly evolving interior. Unfortunately, each room got more unsettling as time passed. The problem was with all the weird characters. Whoever had thought of Freddy Fazbear's characters had a crazy imagination. Who came up with things like a chick with teeth carrying a similarly toothy cupcake? Scott Cawthon. <laughs> 
Uh, who thought up purple bunnies and foxes with eye patches? And who came up with a black striped marionette mask that was painted like a warrior? Hudson didn't even want to know what the rest of that character looked like. Just the mask hanging over one of the doorways was bad enough. The puppet is in here. <laughs> and of course, Faith and her cohorts had played up every element of Fazbear freaky weirdness. Fake blood was art artfully splashed about. Cobwebs and dust and scratches had been added to every surface, not just on the walls. Apparently, in addition to the coming animations, they were going to be adding sound soon, very soon. Hudson had to assume the sounds would be turned off at night, but he wasn't sure if that was the case. He wondered how he could keep his sanity if he had to listen to Fazbear's sound effects in addition to seeing the disturbing sights. Maybe once the boxes were gone, it would get better. Something about those boxes was disconcerting. He didn't know what lurked inside of them. What was coming out next? After he'd gotten past the fake office, the janitor's closet and the kitchen, Hudson did a sweep through the dining room and checked the stage, doing his best to stay out of arm's reach of the character statues. He knew that was silly. They were statues, not animatronics. But he couldn't help himself. He just felt like they were going to grab him if he got too close. Hudson checked behind the stage. He noticed more animatronic suit parts had come in. They were scattered across the floor and hanging on the walls. Blood, aka red paint, remember that, he told himself, had been flung across many of the suit parts. Leaving the backstage area, he went down a few of the meandering hallways until he got to Pirate's Cove. Faith had told him that Pirate's Cove was in the dining room in the restaurants, but she wanted to make it a separate space here. I mean, she said when she was still talking to Hudson, imagine the fright it will give people when this pirate's hook slashes through the curtain over and over, she giggled. Hudson didn't think it was funny. He was glad Foxy's head, with one eye covered by a black eye patch, was disconnected from the rest of the character suit. He hated to think about a functional character, be it a human wearing a suit or an animatronic, that controlled the lethal looking hook. Leaving Pirate's Cove, Hudson moved on to the fake office. There, he discovered a bin of character parts and props that had been added. He could see the neck of a rock guitar sticking out of the disembodied heads. A loaded trash can had been shoved into the room as well. One of the rats was digging into the garbage. Hudson quickly shut the door and moved on, completing his circuit and ending up back in the lobby under the crumbling brick archway. Hudson looked at his watch. It was only 1.50am. He had over five hours to go before Virgil would come back to, revive, to relieve him for a few hours. Virgil was supposed to come in at seven, along with Barry and Duane, uh, Duane sorry, but he was um, usually late. Hudson tapped his nightstick against his thigh. Time to go to hide in the real office and watch the monitors for a while. Hudson entered the office and put his nightstick back on his belt. He holstered his flashlight and sank into his chair. This room was Hudson's sanctuary. It was the only place in the building where he didn't feel like hundreds of eyes were on him. I got a notification. Um, the only thing in the office that made him nervous was the huge vent cover high on the wall above his desk. A couple of days ago, he decided that someone or something could easily watch him through that louvered cover. So he brought an old blanket from home and tacked it over the vent cover. So far, no one had said anything about it. He wondered if Virgil had ever felt like he was being watched through the vent. Hudson never asked him. Hudson leaned back and put his feet up. He settled in to wait for the night to pass. I feel like there's some subtle foreshadowing there. <laughs> the vent is going to be important. Uh, when Hudson returned from a short break the next day, it was, clearly, it was nearly noon. Barry and Duane were carrying in another tower of boxes and Faith was sitting on the floor, putting all sorts of new vintage finds from the card cardboard containers. We're breaking for lunch in 15, Duane called to Hus Hudson as Hudson entered the building. Will you be in the office? Sure. Hudson figured he could fit in his starting circuit if in that time if he hurried. Even though he and his friends weren't as close as they used to be, he still found their company comforting. It made him feel just a little less alone in the world. He didn't like to think about what it would be like after they shipped out. He'd missed the camarader camarad oh my god, I can never say this word, camaraderie, <laughs> uh, and the stupid jokes. Duane was always telling really bad dad jokes. What do you call wood when it's scared? 
Duane asked as he and Barry came into the office at the same moment Hudson was returning from his rounds. Hudson said, I don't know. What? Petrified. Pet, pet, petrified? What do you call a wood? What do you call wood when it's scared? Petrified. I don't get it. <laughs> I don't. I. Oh, God. I don't get it. Petrified. I, no, I don't know. <laughs> you guys going to have to tell me in the comments. Am I being really dumb? Petrified? What? Petri Is that like a type of wood? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Duane barked out a laugh. Corny. Barry shook his head. Uh, Hudson chuckled. Barry took out a bag and crossed the room to where a small microwave sat on a shelf. Guess what I bought you guys? Food, Duane asked. Funny. Not just any food, chicken fried steak with white gravy, mashed potatoes and homemade creamed corn. Will you marry me? Duane asked Barry. Anyone who marries you gets your grandma in the deal, right? Sure, but you're not my type. What is your type? Hudson asked. Not you, Barry, Barry said. All three men laughed. Barry stuck the food in the microwave and turned it on. Immediately, the nearly intoxicating aroma of chicken fried steak filled the room. Hudson realised just how hungry he was. Speaking of marriage, Duane said to Barry, How'd your date with Faith go? Hudson stiffened. Barry went out with Faith? Great. Barry said, Really great. She's pretty amazing. Barry looked down at his hands and then looked at Hudson. She said you two went on a date once, but it didn't work out. Are you okay with me de dating her? I won't if you're not. Hudson shrugged. Sure, I'm okay with it. I'm not dating her. I'd have to be a world-class jerk to say you can't just because I went on a date with her. What happened? Duane asked. Hudson rolled his eyes. What do you think? Duane and Barry looked at each other. We didn't tell her, Barry said. We don't want to talk to anyone about it. Hudson shrugged. Barry opened the microwave and pulled out the steaming plastic containers. He started parceling out the food on paper plates. <laughs> the paper pals. <laughs> Hudson was trying not to be mad at his friend, but he didn't think he could bring himself to accept his charity on top of everything. None for me, Hudson said. I'm not hungry. You sure? Barry asked. Hudson nodded. Barry shrugged, but left some food in the containers. I'll leave your share here for when you get hungry later. Through a mouthful of mashed potatoes, Duane added, unless I get to it first. Barry handed Duane a napkin. Close your mouth. Didn't your mama teach you any manners? Hudson looked past his friends and checked the monitors. He noticed the stacks of boxes had grown higher in the lobby. How much more stuff are you two bringing in? He asked. We were told there were a couple more truckfuls coming in, Barry said. Some big fund is arriving tomorrow. Sorry, some big find is arriving tomorrow. What kind of find? Oh, I bet it's spring trap. I bet it's spring trap. Uh, Hudson asked. Duane shrugged in response. I don't care about any more finds, Hudson said. When is the phone system being put in? Day after tomorrow, I think. Barry asked. Faith said she wanted to get a couple more projects done before that team came in. Trying not to imagine Faith and Barry together. Hudson shifted his gaze from mon one monitor to the next. He shook his head at all the junk being crammed into the building. What's wrong? Duane asked. Hudson shrugged. He didn't want to get into sharing his feelings with his friends. Whatever you say, Duane said. I didn't say anything, Hudson said. Duane licked his plate. Whatever. You know you look like a dog when you do that, Barry said. Right? I don't care, Duane said. It's good. He put down the clean paper plate and looked at Hudson. What's up with you the last few days? You've been acting weird. Hudson shrugged. When Faith asked me if I did it, it brought it all back, you know. Messed in my head. Barry cringed. That's why I asked if you wanted me not to see her. You like her? Hudson asked. I do. Well then date her. We'll be gone in a couple of months, Duane pointed out. Barry shrugged. No one can predict the future. Granny can, Hudson said. The men laughed. When his shift break came later in the day, Hutton declined his friend's invitation to dinner. He needed to go see Granny. You need a ride? Barry asked. I'll walk, Hudson said. He decided he wouldn't even try to sleep this evening. He'd visit Granny, get her to feed him, and then see if she had something for boosting his energy. If anyone could keep him awake, it would be Granny. So Hudson left Fazbear's Frights behind at 5pm, and then he strode the ten blocks to his Granny's place. The day was cool but dry. The first of the four leaves skittered along the concrete in front of him as he walked. He inhaled the scent of crab apples, which had fallen from the trees by the sidewalk. Granny had told him scents have power, 
and when a scent is appealing, inhaling it will give you strength. Don't inhale putrid smells, she warned him once. They're more than just smells, everything is more than it seems. Just shy of the modern apartment building that housed his granny, Hudson caught a scent of something rotting. He covered his mouth with his hand and jogged into the building as some young, hip businessman was coming out. When you thought of a granny like Granny Foster, unconcerned by appearances, who followed the old ways and who used voodoo dolls to handle conflicts, you didn't think of finding that granny in an ultra-modern, open-loft apartment. When Hudson was a kid, Granny Foster had lived in an old house near where Hudson and his parents lived. By the time of the fire, though, Granny had moved. She said the energy was better downtown, and the place was closer to men. Granny Foster had started dating. Hudson grinned as he took the sleek black elevator up to the sixth floor of the old warehouse that had been converted to lofts. Thinking about Granny Foster dating always cheered him up. Hudson had never met Grandpa Foster. He died before Hudson was born. It was hard to imagine a man strong enough for the likes of Granny Foster. So far, none of her dates had gotten even a semi-permanent position. Hudson stepped off the elevator, listened to the ding as it closed behind him, and strode over a polished cement floor down the far end of the hall. Someone on this floor was baking cookies. They smelled like sugar cookies. He was sure that someone wasn't Granny. Her idea of baking didn't result in something as yummy as a cookie. Two steps before Hudson reached Granny's door, it opened. Granny was wearing a red and green plaid shirt with her baggy jeans. You're late. Hudson hadn't told her he was coming. He chose to ignore her words. He leaned over to hug her. She smelled like exotic spices and, and, and peaches. He inhaled. Granny Foster's power didn't come from her size. She was only five feet, one inch, and she was as skinny as Hudson was. <laughs> five feet, one inch, two measurements. Uh... Like, if you get it, uh, he'd have been concerned about breaking her when he'd hugged her if he hadn't learnt over the years that she had a power that was much stronger than her barely encased bones. Nothing was going to break Granny Foster. A fan of being out in the sun, Granny Foster's skin was dark and thick like cracked leather, and she'd had wrinkles layered on wrinkles uh, for as long as Hudson could remember. She'd also had wild, jaw-length hair that was always in disarray. Her hair was white. It's, apparently her hair had turned white when she was not much older than Hudson was now. He'd never asked her why. Somehow, neither the wrinkles nor the white hair made Granny appear old or weak. Combined with her sharp features and unusually bright blue eyes, they made her look tough, which she was. When he let her go, Granny Foster kicked the door shut and, no and motioned for Hudson to follow her. Instead of leading him to the black leather sofa by the water wall window that looked over downtown, she led him to the center of the room and pointed. Is that a fire pit? Hudson asked, staring at the small stone walled circle with the burning coals within. Granny waved a hand. Fake, but it'll do. Her voice did not match her body. Deep and gravelly, Granny's voice belonged in a trucker's body. It was one of the reasons she was scary. When she spoke, her guttural tones sounded like a demon was controlling her and using her body to speak with to helpless humans. Well, aren't you in a snit? <laughs> oh, God. Um, well, aren't you in a snit? Um, Granny said. Hudson said nothing. He'd learned that speaking as little as possible was the best way to interact with Granny. You had to wait for her to say whatever she was going to say and then go away and try and figure it out later. Sit. She pointed an orange-yellow pillow. Orange-yellow? Orange pillow on the floor by the fire pit. Hudson sat. It's wafting from you like you rolled in excrement, Hudson. You have to let it go. That's my, uh, satanic voice. <laughs> How? Leave it. What? The job. Granny dropped her 82-year-old body into an impressive for her age, cross-legged position. Oh, jeez. Um, you need to leave that job, Hudson. Hudson frowned. He thought so too, but he also thought that his thoughts were, were the ravings of an idiot. He was making more money than he'd ever made before. Not that it was enough yet, but it was a step in the right direction. What was he going to do? Go back to making minimum wage and dealing with all the jerks who came into the convenience store, who treated him like he was a piece of gum stuck to the bottom of their shoes? I can't, Granny, he said. Hmm. Hudson thought about Granny and her predictions. Maybe she knew something. Why should I quit? Hudson asked. What do you know about Fazbear's frights? 
She squinted at him. All I need to know. She reached out and squeezed his hand. I care about you, Hudson. Quit your job. There she went again, saying nothing substantive. It was just more of her silly voodoo. Hudson shook his head. If I give in, he shook his head again. <laughs> I can't. Granny sighed. Your path is your own. She held his gaze for several minutes. Then she popped up. Come on, let's have pizza. I'll call it in. I don't know why it sounds like very like creepy and like threatening. <laughs> let's have pizza. Um, Hudson grinned. Sure, why not? That night at Fazbear's Frights passed without incident and Hudson was so relaxed when he went home after his shift that he actually went to sleep and stayed asleep for five hours. He returned to his job late in the morning, just in time to watch Barry and Duane unload a coffin-sized wood crate from their truck and carry it inside the building. Accepting the keyring from Virgil, Hudson trotted up the front steps of the building and watched his friends carry the box down the hall. What is that? Hudson called out. Come and see, Duane said. It's going to be mind-blowing. You won't believe where this was found. Hudson looked his locked Sorry, Hudson hooked his keys on his belt and followed his friends. Where are we going? Hudson asked. The inner hall, Barry directed. That's where they want it. Get this, Duane said. This was found inside a hidden room in one of the pizzerias. Yeah, it's definitely Springtrap. Barry smiled. Faith is really excited about it. She said there's going to be, uh, they're going to put it in a hidden room here now. And it's going to be the best feature of the whole attraction. Hudson looked down at his nightstick and adjusted it so Barry wouldn't see how flushed his face was. Is she here now? Hudson asked as casually as he could. It must have sounded good because Barry just as casually replied, no, she's spending the day shopping for fabric and paint or whatever to go with this new prop. While they talked, Barry and Duane grunted and shuffled their way down the long hall. It didn't occur to Hudson to offer help. He was too busy thinking about faith to be, thought to be thoughtful. He noticed the hallway was free of boxes in this section. More character parts had been added to the walls. He thought there were at least a dozen or more new pairs of eyes peering out from the walls. Barry and Duane dropped the crate on the linoleum with a res resounding thud. Sorry, Hudson flinched. Sure, he heard, on the heels of the thud, a metallic sound coming from inside the crate. Duane plopped his butt on the, on the crate and wiped sweat from his face with the hem of his t-shirt. I left the crowbar near Pirate's Cove, Barry said. I'll go get it. You're not going to open that, are you? Hudson asked. What? Duane asked. Don't tell me you're afraid of what's in this box. He looked up at Hudson. You think we haven't noticed how jumpy you are around this stuff? You're letting this weirdness... He waved a hand around the walls. Get to you. And... That's your choice, man. But you're living into the power of suggestion, basic psychology. What you expect is what happens, self-fulfilling prophecy and all that. I know you took psych too, Barry. Remember the experiments they did that proved that, when, that what you see when you look at things in the world depends not as much on what's actually there, but more on the assumptions you're making when you look at things. Remember? Sure, Barry said. But it's not for you to tell Hudson. Hudson touched Barry's arm. It's okay. He kept his face nonchalant and said... I need to go on my rounds. He strode away, but he could hear Barry talking as he did. You could be a real jerk, you know that, Barry said. What did I do? Duane asked, sounding genuinely baffled. Of course, he wouldn't get it. Duane, as far as Hudson knew, had never been afraid of anything in his life. He was always the first one to jump off the roof when they were trying to fly. Always the first one out on the ice to check the pond for ice skating always the first one to charge into a fight to break it up on the playground. Barry was no slouch at being courageous either. He once got a $1,000 reward from an old lady when he climbed a 100-foot tree to rescue the woman's cat. And Hudson? What had he done? He'd hid from Lewis instead of fighting back. Hudson shook himself mentally and stomped down the hall to do his rounds. A half hour later, Hudson was on his way to the office when Duane called to him. You have to come and see this thing. It is creeptastic. Leave him alone, Barry said. Oh, come on. It's not a demon. It's an old animatronic. A whole animatronic. It's amazing. Look at the detail. Hudson wanted nothing but to go to the office, shut the door, lock it, and take a nap. 
but he wasn't going to give Duane the satisfaction, so he strolled down the hall as if he couldn't care less about what was in the crate. When he reached his friends, he stopped dead, trying to wrestle the animatronic upright and get it propped against the wall. Barry and Duane had their arms around the most bizarre looking thing Hudson had ever seen. Right, bizarre. He was using that word because using the word terrifying would mean that he was afraid, and he was afraid. But he sure didn't want to admit it to anyone, including himself. Hudson called on an old trick he'd used when Lewis was on a rampage. He narrowed his eyes until his focus was almost down to a pinpoint. He'd learned when he was young that when your perspective was that narrow, what you were facing wasn't as horrifying. Using that pinpoint focus, all Hudson could see, propped between Barry and Duane, was a set of white star staring eyes with heavy green lids. That was enough to freak Hudson out. But it was also a small enough part of the thing that his friends were wrestling with that he could act uh, relaxed and unconcerned. Testing that theory, he spoke. What are you doing with it? Dancing? His voice sounded normal and light. He congratulated himself. Faith wants the thing standing here against this wall, Barry said. He grunted and shifted his side of the life-size animatronic. Did you get these hooks attached? He asked Duane. Or are you just going to flirt with it? Duane pulled a couple hooks out of his pocket. You hold your side in place. I'll lean against my side and I'll attach the hooks to the wall. Then we'll, sit, then we'll switch places and set up the other side. I'll leave you to it, Hudson said, turning to go to the office. Want to go for dinner after work? Uh, Barry called out. Hudson stopped and looked back. I can't, sorry. Virgil isn't coming in this evening. I'll be here until tomorrow morning. Sorry, Duane said. Sucks to be you. Thanks for that. Hudson said, shaking his head. I'm just saying, Duane said, maybe the seals can teach you not to stick your foot in your mouth, Barry said to Duane as Hudson was walking away. Hudson fully expected to have an easy night of it. In spite of the addition of the new animatronic, he was feeling good when he closed the building up for the night. Maybe pretending to be relaxed was actually making him feel more relaxed. He figured he could make the self-fulfilling prophecy thing work for him, and it did, until he decided to poke the bear, and that was when he got all courageous and resolved to face his fears. He'd spent the rest of the night paying for it. Normally, Hudson did his rounds in the same direction and the same order, but tonight he was eager. So he started at the end, intending to reverse his usual direction. This brought him to the new animatronic near the beginning of his circuit instead of the end. As he approached the scruffy thing, he planned to face it right off and get it out of the way. He was going to rob it of its power to upset him. Good plan, but he forgot to squint his eyes, and he wasn't planning on the thing talking to him either. Hudson strode down the inner wall, and he found a new animatronic hooked to the wall just where Duane, uh, Duane, Duane and Barry left it. Posed in a friendly hand-up-to-wave position, the animatronic's posture wasn't threatening, but really anything that looked like this was threatening, no matter what it was doing. Hudson faced the animatronic, then stumbled back and sucked in his breath. What in the world was this thing supposed to be? At first glance, the robotic character attached to the wall appeared to be a rabbit, sort of. With fur of greenish-yellow, this was no ordinary rabbit. Though, not even a cartoon rabbit, it was the kind of rabbit Dr. Frankenstein might have created if he'd wanted to build a rabbit instead of a man. Ears torn, dozens of pieces of the bodies and limbs, uh, and limbs, uh, yellow-green fur stripped away, or chewed away, it was hard to tell. This was a rabbit that would never be cuddled by any child, it shouldn't have seen by, it been seen by a child either. Where the fur was torn, you could see metal pieces of the animatronic structure, exposed wires linked to an oxidized metal frame and something else. What was that? Hudson couldn't help himself. He leaned in to take a better look. Was that? No. It can't be. He studied the reddish and greyish areas that could be seen through the gaps in the fur and metal. It looked like... Hudson took a step back and clutched at his nightstick. He realized he was breathing too fast, and he bent over to get a grip on himself. He needed to go back to squinting, but he couldn't. He had to know. Stepping closer again, Hudson tilted his head to get a better look at what was hiding under the fur and metal. He was, he was going to show himself that his crazy flight of gruesome fancy was just that. Fancy. 
it's 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 there's a human in it isn't there um but it wasn't hudson lifted a finger and carefully extended his hand far enough to touch what was inside the ravaged fur and the exposed metal he put the tip of his finger against the reddish material and he jumped back so fast he lost his balance and fell against the opposite wall it was it was tissue maybe not no probably not human tissue but it was some kind of bodily tissue who would want to terrify someone with gore like this? It couldn't be real. It's real, a scratchy voice said. Hudson scrambled back. It spoke. The, animus, the animatronic spoke? No, that wasn't possible. Duane and Barry told him the thing was completely non-functional. Experts were going to be brought back in to work on it. And even then, they figured it was beyond the repair. If you weren't so stupid, I'll tell you more about it, the voice said. The voice was distinctive, way too distinctive. A bass voice with a burr-like rasp. Um, <laughs> Aaron Burr. Uh, the voice had a hint of a sudden a accent. Hudson knew that voice. It was Mr. Atkins' voice. Hudson drew his stick. How could Mr. Atkins' voice be coming out of this thing? Or did the voice come from the animatronic? No, Hudson didn't think so. The voice seemed to fill his head, coming more from inside his ears than outside of them. He couldn't pin down a direction. Who said that? Hudson asked. He looked around, then looked back at the animatronic. It hung on the wall, its tooth-filled mouth completely still. Still, sorry. Uh, Hudson turned his head to look up and down the wall. Stupid, the voice said again. Hudson whipped his gaze back to the animatronic's mouth. It was exactly as it had been before. Hudson stared at the mouth for several minutes. The voice didn't speak. The hallway was silent. Hudson blinked and looked down the length of the animatronic, staring at the jagged lower edge of the fur ending above exposed ankle bones. Were those bones? Nah, that was stupid. They had to be metal supports discoloured by age. Do the math, the voice said. The voice and the word math brought back a rush of memories from Mr. Atkins' algebra class. Hudson could suddenly smell the chalk in the classroom, feel his sweat-dampened jeans sticking to the hard seat of his desk. He could feel his classmates' eyes on him, feel Mr. Atkins' disdain. He wanted to run away and hide. Tears welled in Hudson's eyes, but then he remembered he wasn't a child anymore. He felt a surge of anger, and he shoved his nightstick in the animatronic's mouth. He heard a snap, a tinkle, and a clatter on the floor. He'd broken off one of the animatronic's teeth. Or had he? Was that tooth there when he first approached the thing? This is nuts, Hudson said. He reached out and grabbed the animatronic. His intention was to carry it to a closet and lock it inside. But the thing was heavier than it looked, and it wouldn't budge from the wall. Dead weight. <laughs> uh, what kind of hooks did you use? Hudson asked the absent Duane. He peered at the connections, and he couldn't figure out how to release them. Is it, is it um, spring locks, I assume? Um, well, okay, this was good, right? This meant the animatronic couldn't go anywhere. Hudson set his shoulders, turned, and strode down the hall away from the abomination hanging on the wall. He might have heard a whispered stupid as he went, but he wasn't sure, and he decided to pretend he hadn't. Instead, he marched into the dining room to do his rounds properly from the beginning, Striding past the tables, he thought about that voice. He hadn't heard that voice in over ten years. He hadn't even thought about Mr. Atkin in that amount of time either. Why was he suddenly hearing a voice that sounded like Mr. Atkin? Was someone playing a prank on Hudson? Would Duane and Barry do that? Duane, maybe, but not Barry. Let it go, Hudson told himself. Maybe he'd imagined the whole thing. He had gotten himself totally worked up about this place in the last few days. He'd never taken rejection well, and his disappointment in Faith, who did not live up to her name, <laughs> uh, could have caused a little emotional crash and burn. Maybe his mind was tormenting him because he was tormenting himself for not handling Faith's question better. What would she have done if, she, if he hadn't gotten defensive? He could have just said, no, of course I didn't do it. Or what if he just said, did what? All innocent and made her explain her question. He could have said, that's not an easy question to answer. That would have been the most honest thing he could have said. Would she have gone out with him again if he hadn't snapped at her? Stop it, Hudson ad admonished himself. 
going through these what ifs and should haves was like beating his head against a brick wall. Hudson went through the archway and started passing the crippled arcade games. Since he was already carrying his nightstick, he beat a rhythm on the metal and plastic and wood as he passed the game remains. He did this every night. It broke up the tedium. Tonight's drumming session wasn't typical though. As he drummed, Hudson swore he could hear singing. He stopped drumming and the singing stopped. Who was singing? Hudson took a step back and looked around the dining room. His gaze slipped past the characters on the stage and then it jerked back. The characters. They'd moved since he'd passed them. The singing started again, and the characters' lips were moving. They were singing. That was not possible. They were statues. Hudson went back in the arcade and started rapping his nightstick more loudly on the games. He was determined to drown out the impossible singing. Before Hudson could rap on the third time in the line, though, he got another surprise. This one was not as benign. Suddenly, Hudson's nightstick was ripped from his gasp. Uh, grasp, sorry, and thrown across the room. It hit the wall with a thwack at the same time Hudson's head slammed down onto the scarred wooden desk under the window in his bedroom. Why isn't your homework done? Lewis bellowed. The impact was powerful and the corner of the desk that contact contacted with Hudson's temple was sharp. So he was hit with the door double with a double whammy of searing pain and a blinding stream of blood flowing down into his eyes. Stumbling back, Hudson swiped at the blood, trying to clear his vision so he could see Lewis enough to know what the man was going to do next. Lewis had been hitting Hudson for years, but this was the first time Lewis had slammed his head into something. As Hudson wiped his eyes, he rotated, staggering. But he didn't see anyone. Where was Lewis? He was gone. Hudson was alone in the arcade. Wait, wait, what, what just happened? Pressing his hand to the bleeding wound at his hairline, Hudson blinked at the arcade game in front of him, a bent and crooked alien invaders type game. He saw blood on its metal frame. He wasn't in his bedroom. Lewis didn't just slam his head into a desk. His head had been slammed into the game. Hudson looked for his nightstick. He couldn't find it, and he couldn't stop with the bleeding with his hand. He had to get back to the office. He had a first aid kit there. But was it safe? Something really weird was going on. Why did he hallucinate a scene from his childhood? A muted thud sounded from a few feet away. Who's there? Hudson shouted. He held still, listening. He heard nothing but his hitched breathing. He tried to ignore the pounding in his head so he could think. Blood trickled down the hand Hudson used, uh, held to his head. Whatever happened, he needed to bandage his wound. He couldn't just stand here. Retracing his steps through the dining room, Hudson scanned the area for a threat, but it was too dim and well shallowed for him to have a clear view of every part of the room. The tables, chairs, muted lighting and cast shadows provided too many hidey holes for anyone who might want to attack or torment Hudson. Besides, he knew no one was there anyway. He was alone in the building, which made what just happened all the more distressing. Still bleeding, Hudson rushed through the room. Then he jogged down the hall toward the office. He made it there without any trouble. After closing and locking the office door, Hudson checked all of the monitors before awkwardly wiping blood from his wound and covering it first with gau gauze, gauze, I think it's gauze, and then with surgical tape. While he doctored himself, he tried to ignore the pain throbbing at his temples and he tried not to think about the monitors showing no movement of any kind in the whole building. Hudson finished his first aid efforts and sank into his chair. He looked at his bloody hands, then got up. He had to go to the restroom and get himself cleaned up. He looked around the room. Without his nightstick, he felt exposed and vulnerable. He needed a weapon. He spotted a hammer he'd forgotten to return to the supply closet after he'd used it to fix his desk a couple days before. He picked it up, hefted it, swung it, and nodded, satisfied. This would work. He took a breath, checked the monitors again, and turned to and turned toward wait. He looked back at the monitors. He blinked and rubbed his eyes. His vision was a little blurry, probably from both the blood in his eyes and the blow to his head. Was he seeing that wrong? He leaned toward the monitor in question. No, he wasn't seeing it wrong. He was seeing what he was seeing. Where the animatronic that was supposed to be latched, immobile and trapped to the wall in the... Oh, sorry. Where was the animatronic... <laughs> Where was the animatronic that was supposed to be latched, immobile and trapped to the wall in the inner hall? 
Hudson flung the office door open, gripping the hammer so hard his knuckles turned white. He strode down the hall to the... Oh hell, it was gone. It really was gone. Hudson gawked at the empty hooks hanging from the wall. Hudson heard a scuffling sound behind him. He whirled. Nothing was there. Or was something there? Hiding just past that pile of character suits. Hudson pulled out his flashlight and shined it around the hallway. No, he didn't see any movement. He took a step down the hall, moving toward the bathroom. Turning in circles constantly, he tried to be aware of the entire hallway at once. He wished he had eyes in the back of his head. He made it to the men's bathroom without further incident. Pushing the door open, he tensed and raised his hammer. Who knew that what, what was lurking in here? Was it the mutilated rabbit waiting for him? Hudson snorted at the word rabbit. He was thinking of the animatronic as a rabbit because it made him feel better to think of it being uh, about as threatening as a teddy bear. But of course, that was just his ignorance. Stupid, the Mr. Atkin voice said. Hudson whirled. He was alone. Again, he couldn't tell where Mr. Atkin's voice came from because it was his voice. Hudson was sure of it. For once, Mr. Atkin was right. It was stupid to think of the animatronic as a rabbit. It was as much of a rabbit as Hudson was. No, the abomination that Hudson's friends had so calmly installed this morning was not a rabbit at all. It was a robot, and it was more. Hudson was pretty sure the remains of a corpse were stuck inside the rabbit suit skeleton. He wasn't 100% convinced, but he was convinced enough. Quickly checking to be sure all the stools were empty, Hudson held the hammer with one hand while he splashed water on his free hand. He quickly realised this was a clumsy way to clean up that wasn't going to work. And after double checking the room, he set down the hammer and started to wash his hands in preparation for cleaning up his face. He never should have set down the hammer. Hudson went from standing still to backpedalling toward the handicap accessible stool in a half blink of a second. He was by the sink, and then he wasn't. Now he was skidding across the bathroom, hauled by unseen hands toward the toilet in the bigger stool. Hudson screamed, Stop it! and tried to grab at the stool doorway as he went through it. He couldn't get a grip on it to stop his progress. He slid the few feet to, on, uh, to the toilet. Hold him down, one of the boys shouted. Get his shoulders, another one yelled. Hudson got one last glimpse of the grey linoleum floor of the boys' bathroom before he felt his head going into the toilet. He closed his eyes and his mouth, just as he was submerged. Then the water swirled to the sound of laughter. Hudson flailed and thrashed and fell back into the closed door of the stool. He coughed, spit, and tried to upchuck what little food he had in his stomach. Water sluiced, <laughs> sluiced. Um, yeah, water went down his neck and trickled under his shirt. Get away from me, he screamed at the bullies tormenting him, even though he knew that yelling would spur them to do something else to him. He tensed, praising for another assault. Nothing happened. Hudson looked around. His gaze fell on the floor, the black and white floor. He squinted at it, then put a hand on it. No grey linoleum. His upper lip curled at the scent of urine. Hudson hefted himself to his feet, fumbled with the stool door, and bolted for the nearest sink. He stuck his head under the faucet and scrubbed at his face and hair with the hottest water he could stand. When he was done, he used a pile of paper towels to dry himself off as well as he could. Then Hudson looked back into the stool he'd just exited. He stared at it. What was wrong with it? Something wasn't right. Hudson took a step back. Then he took two steps forward. No, that wasn't possible. But it was. The toilet in the stool and the stool door were completely dry, and it smelled the way the rest of the bathroom smelled, like soap and disinfectant. If he just whipped his head out of a urine-filled toilet, water would be splashed all over, and the stool would, have, would still have that acidic, putrid uh, scent. How could the stool look suddenly pristine? Hudson couldn't make sense of this, and it made him angry. Think you've gotten me, don't you? Hudson shouted. He didn't know whom he was shouting at, and that made him even angrier. What do you want? He screamed, or to whom, or what he didn't know. No one and nothing answered. Hudson breathed heavily for several seconds, then he sighed. Okay, I give. He wasn't sure what it was going to accomplish to give him to his opponent. 
who was his opponent, but maybe acting meek could buy him some time to figure out what was going on. <laughs> acting meek? He wasn't acting at all. He wanted to surrender, wave the white flag and roll over on his back like a submissive puppy. He wasn't up for whatever kind of warfare he was in. He didn't understand it and he wasn't equipped for it. Speaking of which, he picked up the hammer. He didn't want to stay in the bathroom all night. He might as well head back to the office. He took a step. He stopped when he heard a chuckle. That was a chuckle, right? Yes, there was another one. Now he was being laughed at. Where was the laughter coming from? It sounded like it was coming from above him. Hutton looked up. Sure enough, there was the source of the laughter. The yellow-green rabbit's head was hanging out through the opening of the big vent high on the wall. Oh, God. Its mouth was open, and it was laughing its head off. Hutton roared and threw his hammer at the tooth-filled head. The head disappeared back into the vent. Hutton stared at the opening. He had to pursue, didn't he? First, if he didn't pursue, he'd know he was a coward. Second, how would he know where the rabbit went if he didn't follow it? If he didn't know where it was, he was in more danger. Before he could think about it, Hutton jumped up onto a toilet seat, climbed onto the pipes, then to the top of the stool door. He grabbed the lip of the vent and heaved himself up into the cavernous tube above the ceiling. Once there, he went rigid, expecting further attack. Nothing happened. He pulled out his flashlight, flipped it on and shined it around. He was alone. He stopped and sat in the giant vent. What was he doing in here? This was crazy. Did he really want to go after the animatronic rabbit? Hutton straightened his shoulders. Yes. Yes, he did. He wasn't going to be a snivelling kid anymore. He was going to stand up to the bullies and his miserable stepdad. He was going to go rabbit hunting. Hutton giggled at his joke. Did his giggle sound a little demented to his own ears? Wasn't he uh, slipping in and out of his present and his past? For a second, he was a kid pretending he had the courage to go after the bullies who hurt him. But it was just a second. He knew where he was and he knew he had to go on the offensive or he was going to lose his mind. Getting onto his hands and knees, Hudson put his flashlight in his mouth and crawled away from the opening to the men's restroom. Stopping every few feet to take the flashlight from his mouth and aim it at that this way and that while he listened for sounds, he got about 20 feet before he encountered his first character head. Startled, he lifted his own head and bumped it on the metal above him. He scuttled backward and stared at the face looking back at him. It was Freddy Fazbear himself. Not really, it was a Freddy costume head. An old, nearly threadbare one. Or was that threadbare? <laughs> Funny. Uh, Hudson giggled again. And he had to admit the giggle was too childish sounding. He needed to focus on the task at hand. Find the escaped rabbit. No, find the bullies. No, find the strange animatronic. He scooted forward to a vent corner. He peered around the corner and he spotted another head. Again, he jumped so violently he banged the top of his head against the metal above him. He forced himself to breathe calmly as he studied the head. It was Chica's, though her teeth were half gone and her bill was torn. Interesting. Interesting. This head was still attached to a part of Chica's body. The body had just a shoulder, an arm and a hand. Yeah, this must be the um, logbook Chica, right? Is that what we're thinking? I don't know how that fits in, though. Hudson gave the thing a wide berth, watching it to be sure it wasn't going to suddenly grow feet and come after him. He didn't stop watching until he rounded a corner. Hudson didn't know how long he crawled through the vent system. He also didn't know how many heads he found. He lost track of both time and sensory input. Every stretch of the vent seemed like every other. Every turn was both familiar and unfamiliar. Several times he was sure he got a glimpse of yellow-green fur up ahead. Each time, he stiffened and readied himself for an attack, but one never came. Twice, Hudson heard the scrabbling of little claws on the metal in the vent, and he spotted one of the rats. He dropped rat droppings too. Gross, Hudson said more than once when he put his palm on rat poop. Sometimes, when he stopped moving, Hudson was sure he heard swishing sounds or tapping sounds or clinks or bumps from up ahead or behind him. Mostly, though, he heard his own breathing, his own ragged, laboured breathing. Finally, his knees sore and his head throbbing and tingling, he decided he was never going to win a game of hide-and-seek in these vents. 
and he had to get back to the office and rewrap his head. So he turned to crawl down a vent tunnel that went toward light. He wasn't sure where he was in the building. He'd gotten totally disoriented. But he was sure he had the leg strength to kick out a vent cover. And because the vent openings were so huge and the ceilings weren't unusually tall, he figured he could drop from the vent opening to the ground no matter where he came out. He began crawling ahead, but something grabbed his foot. Something grabbed his foot and held on. Swallowing a scream, Hutton turned and looked behind him. He fully expected to see nothing, because he kept seeing nothing when he turned to check sounds. But this time, something was there. Screaming, Hutton yanked his foot toward, the bod toward his body and sat up. Once again, he bashed the top of his head against the vent tunnel ceiling, but he didn't pause to care about it, because the thing hanging onto his foot was still hanging on. Get off! He screeched. Get off! He using his flashlight. He beat at the yellow arm that had a grip on his foot. It was Chica again. The Chica head attached to a shoulder, arm and hand, and the hand was hanging on to Hudson's foot as if his foot was the most important thing in the world. She just has a fetish. <laughs> Hudson shook his foot and pounded on the yellow hand that wouldn't let go. I like you. Oh God. Yeah, maybe it is a fetish. I like you, a woman's voice said. Not just any woman's voice, Faith's voice. Hutton froze. He shined his flashlight back and forth in the vent tunnel. Then he aimed the light at Chica's mouth. Had the voice come from Chica? I like you, the voice said again. The voice didn't sound like it was coming from the Chica head. Just as the Mr Atkins voice had come from a void Hudson couldn't locate, so did this one. This voice, however, had a more immediate impact on Hudson. He felt it squeezing his heart, touching him the way it had when Faith said those very words to him on their, on their only date. I like you, Faith had said. It was the different I like you than the casual way she'd said the words at work before she basically told him to ask her out. In the restaurant, under the muted lights in the alcove, where the small table was tucked, Faith's eyes had looked so soft and sincere when she said it. And it wasn't just, I like you. What she actually said was, I like you a lot, Hudson. You're a nice guy. And then she reached across the table and touched his hand. His fingers were so smooth and warm. And when he turned his hand over and took hers in his, she didn't protest. She just smiled at him in a way no one had ever smiled at him before. It was the best moment of his life, unlike this one. Now Hudson wasn't in the restaurant with Faith. He was in the huge vent with a piece of an animatronic glommed onto his foot. Aware of the pressure still grasping his foot, Hudson tried to lean forward and use his fingers to pry Chica's hand from his shoe. But that was a bad move because Chica had shifted her grip. Now she was holding his right hand. Faith hung on to Hudson's hand when he walked her home. She smiled the whole time too. She listened to him, laughed at his jokes and at one point she even put her head on his shoulder for a moment. A strand of her hair blew up against his neck. It felt so silky and it smelled like berries. Hudson welcomed the warmth, the connection. He looked down at his hand, entwined with, it wasn't Faith's hand in his. No! Hudson screamed. He no longer felt touched, not emotionally anyway. Obviously he was being touched, literally, by the other hand, and maybe he was being touched in the head too. Hudson swung his arm around, which in turn swung the Chica parts around. He battered them over and over against the vent tunnel sides. Chica was oblivious. She held on. He had to get out of here, doing his best to not think about the animatronic part attached to his right hand. Hudson crawled ahead, making for the vent cover he'd had his eye on. He knew if he could get out of the relatively confining vent space, he'd have more room to manoeuvre Chica off his hand. Ignoring Chica's continued expressions of determined love, Hudson crawled to within a couple of feet of the vent cover, turned his body and kicked up the cover loops from the wall. Crawling forward, he shined his light down into the room below. He was backstage. Wow, he was totally turned around. He thought he was on the opposite side of the building. Turning again, Hudson exited the vent tunnel feet first, dropping to the floor and immediately swinging his arm in a wide arc to slam Chico against the floor. When her grip loosened, he flung her free and kicked her into a pile of costume parts on the far side of the dressing area. I like you, he heard again. And then he heard a sound he'd never heard before. It was a sound he could barely describe. It was a roar, he thought at first, and especially a shrill roar 
with distinctive separate tones that told him it was a combined roar, the combined roar of many Venny voices. It was also a breath, a great exhale and a groan all at once. What? Hudson began. The costume parts began to tear the cheeker parts to bits, like a frothing, churning pool filled with fuzzy, colourful pin- piranhas. I was going to say piñatas. Uh, the costume parts came to life, and in seconds, they pulled Chica apart and ripped her into a hundred pieces. He would have kissed Faith goodnight by her door after their date, but her roommate opened the door and walked with between them, just as he was making his move. Later, after Fa- Faith asked, Faith, after Faith called to ask if he'd done it, he realised the roommate had opened the door and walked out deliberately to keep him from kissing Faith. That was probably the moment when it all began to come apart. As quickly as the attack on Chica began, it ended. The pile of costume parts was once again just a pile of parts. It didn't look any different than it had before. And now Hudson was looking at wisps of yellow fabric. Chica had been reduced to almost nothing, just like Hudson. Face rejection had torn from his heart and his hope into little bits. He looked at his hands. Was that yellow fuzz under his nails? Hudson wiped his hands on his pants several times, and once again Hudson was alone in the stillness, not liked, not capable of understanding what was going on. Hudson turned away from the yellow tufts of fur. He ran back toward the office. When he reached the end of the hall, however, he stopped. He looked down at his empty hands. He'd lost his nightstick. He'd lost his hammer. With the animatronic wandering somewhere in the building and with everything else going on, what was going on? He needed a new new weapon. He veered away from the office in the direction of the kitchen. When Faith and her team first designed it, the kitchen was only going to be a replica of one of the pizzeria kitchens, but then management decided they wanted this attraction to be available as a venue for parties. That's when the fake kitchen became a real kitchen. Over the last few days, Barry and Duane, uh, I keep saying Duane, Barry and Duane had been bringing in boxes of kitchen supplies. They were still stacked up next to the counters. Surely one of those boxes contained a knife or something that could be used as a weapon. Hudson reached the kitchen without anything else weird happening, and he found what he needed in the second box he opened. Continually, checking over his shoulder, Hudson armed himself with a butcher knife and a rolling pin. Feeling only a little ridiculous as he left the kitchen, he held both weapons ahead of him as he hurried back to his office. Twice along the way, he was sure he heard a clickety-click behind him, but when he checked both times, nothing was there. Finally reaching the office, Hudson looked around it thoroughly before closing and locking the door. Then, setting down his weapons, he tore off the wet wrap on his head. He used the reminder of his bandages to rewrap it because his head was still oozing. When he was done... He sat down in his chair. Hudson checked both the monitors and the blanket hanging over the vent cover. Nothing was amiss. What should he do next? Hudson looked up at the ceiling, then shook his head. The solution was so easy he couldn't believe he missed it. Stupid, Mr Atkins said from somewhere. Hudson groaned. He was being stupid. He didn't have to stay in this building and and be abused all night. Just plain stupid, the Atkins voice said. Hudson stood. All he had to do was get out of the building. Why was he still in here? It wasn't like he was locked in. He had keys. He reached down and touched his key. He looked down. Where was was his keys? Oh no. The belt loop on which he normally hooked his keys was torn. The keys were gone. He looked madly around the room. Checked his pockets. Looked at the monitors. No keys. Stupid, the Atkin voice reminded him. Hudson closed his eyes and hung his head. If he'd been gone, if he'd gone for his keys first, he would be out of here by now. He opened his eyes. Well, there was nothing he could do about that now, unless he could break out somehow. He was locked in. He couldn't call anyone either. He had no phone, and of course the building's phone system was coming in tomorrow. But why not break out? Surely he couldn't easily reach the few windows in the building. But couldn't he break the glass front doors? Maybe. Or he could just wait out the night in here. It was safe in here. Or at least he'd know if someone was or something was trying to get in. The second he had that thought, something thumped against the door, and the blanket over the vent rippled. The vent made a rending sound, and the vent cover fell down from behind the blanket to land with a clatter on the floor. As soon as the vent landed, animatronic mouths and costume mouths began falling through the opening. 
What's the square root of 144? Mr. Atkin asked. No, not Mr. Atkin. An animatronic mouth. Also, the answer is 12 or minus 12. <laughs> what? Hudson said. Wrong, stupid. Mr. Atkin said. It was Mr. Atkin in his algebra class. I mean, that's not really algebra. <laughs> but okay. Hudson could see the windows looking out at the school parking lot, the cars glistening in the rain. What's 4x plus 6? There we go, Mr. Atkins said. Work the problem. Uh, first of all, you, you, you can't really work that out unless you have a value for x. <laughs> or you would have to find the value of x if it was equal to something. That's just an expression. You can't really do anything with that. <laughs> uh, Hudson looked around. He wasn't in algebra class. He was in his office. Animatronic mouths surrounded him, firing algebra questions at him. Hudson held his head. Stupid, another mouth said, using Mr. Atkins' voice. How do you find a value through the process of substitution? <laughs> okay, Mr. Atkins screamed through another animatronic mouth. As a mathematician, uh, yeah, these are, these are very basic questions. Um, Hudson shook his head and willed himself to see what was real and what wasn't. Stupid, a different mouth said. All the mouths sounded like Mr. Atkin. Stop it, Hudson shrieked. Stop it. All the mouths advanced on him. Stupid, 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 stupid. The assault came from inside and outside of his head, and it came from all around him, as the mouths fell endlessly from a vent opening and pressed toward him in a ghastly chorus of judgment. Hudson tried to get up and run, but the mouths were like marbles flung all over the floor. He lost his balance and fell. And then they overran him. Mouths crawled over him. They skittered up his legs, slithered through his hair, and hopped from one end of his body to the other. Hudson flailed and kicked. He shrieked some more. When a mouth tried to crawl inside his mouth, and another one began to burrow into his ear, he started hearing rumbling in his head, like a thunderstorm was unleashing in itself inside of him. That's when he lost it. He wet his pants. As the hot liquid left his body and soaked his jeans, he began to cry. He was babbling too. He didn't know what he was saying. He was talking gibberish. He was in a world of misery beyond anything he'd experienced before, and that was saying a lot. Wrapping his arms around himself, he began to rock and hum. He didn't know how long he rocked and hummed, but when Hudson stopped, the mouths were gone, completely gone, like they'd never, been, they, like they'd never ever been there. He looked around, then looked up at the blanket. It was hanging in place, and it was thick enough to cover the opening so he couldn't tell if the vent cover was there. He started to stand so he could move the desk and check the vent cover, but that was when he noticed a sticky burning wetness in his pants. Oh man, he had to get cleaned up. He wasn't going to sit in his own pee the rest of the night. Hudson picked up the butcher knife and the rolling pin, pausing the, to listen at the door. Hudson slowly opened it. Hearing nothing, he stepped into the hall and he tripped and fell toward the floor. No, he was grabbed. He was grabbed by the wrist and flung as if he was half his size. The wrenching motion of the grab and fling broke the same wrist Lewis had broken when Hudson was a boy. Or was he still a boy? Hadn't he, fe he just felt Lewis's clammy palm against his skin? Yes, he'd seen the green shag carpet in the hallway of his house flash past his gaze as he flew through the air. You peed your pants, crybaby, Lewis boomed, pathetic. Hudson moaned as he landed. He cradled his snapped wrist against his belly and he gasped in siren-like yelps as he looked around. No green shag carpet. Still the black and white squares. No wasn't, he, no sorry, he wasn't at home. He was in Frasbear's frights and he'd just been flung and he just lost his butcher knife. It was laying a few feet down the hall, still spinning, the black end pointing at him. Then the pointed end, the black end and the pointed end. Uh, again, he was alone. Well, not totally alone. All the animatronics' parts were on the, on the walls were muttering. They were whispering, giggling, pointing, reaching, and worst of all, watching. He could see the eyes on the wall following his movements. Hudson gasped. Two of the reaching arms had weapons. One had his nightstick, and one had the hammer. Both arms swung their weapons back and forth. A partial foxy arm, with its pyro hook extended, was between Hudson's two weapons, but the hook was unmoving. Hudson forced himself to look away from the chaotic movement on the walls. It was making him dizzy. 
or was he dizzy because of the broken wrist? Tears smeared Hudson's face as he dropped the rolling pin and tried to get up without affecting his left wrist. Even the slightest hint of a movement sent red-hot streaks of pain down into his hand and up his arm. It felt like his wrist was a raging bonfire. Managing to get into a sitting position, Hudson, without thinking, started to scoot back against the wall. That was when the sharp end of Foxy's pyro hook cut through the material of his shirt and scratched his back. He yelped and used his right hand and legs to move away from the writhing walls. Once there, he tried to brace himself with his right hand in the middle of the hallway floor, but then he realised he needed his right hand for self-defence. He leaned forward, grabbing the rolling pin, then sat still, trying to get control of his sobbing and his hiccuping breath. On either side of him, parts still reached and grabbed. No, Lewis reached out for him. Hudson was sitting on the green shag carpet, cradling his wrist. Get up, you sissy, Lewis screamed at him. Get up! Hudson hunched over, trying to make himself smaller than he already was. Between his knees, he saw the black and white floor. He dared a glance around. The walls still wanted him, and he was barely out of their range. He tried to think about what he had to do next. He looked around for the knife. It was a few feet down the hall. He didn't have the strength or the will to get it. On reflex, he turned his left wrist to look at his watch, and he screamed loud enough for the sound to echo through the building. He gasped for breath and, and groaned as he managed to get a glimpse of his watch face without turning his wrist any further. It was only 2.08am. He had to get through four more hours before Barry and Duane would arrive. How was he going to last that long? He looked at his wrist again and immediately wished he hadn't. He could see two broken bones poking against the underside of his skin. The sight made his stomach heave. He swallowed hard and took shallow breaths to keep himself from throwing up. Hudson shifted carefully. His urine-stained underwear and jeans were irritating his skin. His butt and thighs were burning and itchy. He wanted to get out of his clothes, but how would he do that without jostling his wrist? Maybe he could just stay where he was for the next four hours. Yeah, it would suck to sit on the hard floor with pea-saturated pants and a broken wrist. But wouldn't trying to move be worse? Hudson nodded to himself and wiped his eyes with his right hand. His heart rate began to slow down. Making that decision had calmed him somewhat. It had taken the pressure off. Things weren't that bad, he told himself. Yes, his wrist had, was badly broken and he'd have to go through all that pain again when he got it set. But at least it was his left hand, and a little pee in his pants never kill anyone. He was going to be okay. You're nothing, a voice said. Hudson sucked in his breath and looked around. Less than nothing, the voice said. Hudson reacted without thinking. He dropped the rolling pin and started to put both hands down so he could prepare to stand. Again, his scream did a tour of the building. Fresh tears ran down his cheeks. Stop it, he shouted. He wasn't sure if he was yelling at himself about forgetting he had a broken wrist or if he was yelling at the noise, at the voice. High pitch and nasally, Lewis's voice was unmistake, unmistakable. So, the, so was the way he said nothing. He never made the th sound. His version of nothing sounded like nothing. You're nothing but smoke, the, voice, <laughs> the Lewis voice said. Hudson grabbed the rolling pin again and waved it in front of him uselessly. Then he tucked the rolling pin under his arm and bent over to cover his right ear with his right hand. Thankfully, he remembered not to use his left hand, but that meant that when the voice spoke again, saying, you're nothing at all, Hudson could hear it just fine through his uncovered left ear. Go away, Hudson begged the voice. He knew it wasn't going to go away, so he wasn't surprised when he heard the Lewis voice say again, nothing, nothing at all. He was surprised, though, when he turned toward the sound and saw the decayed rabbit animatronics shuffling down the hall toward him, staring intently at Hudson. The thing's mouth was moving. Nothing, it said. Less than nothing. Nothing but smoke. <laughs> and again, nothing. Less than nothing. Nothing but smoke. It was still Lewis's voice, but it was coming through the dreadful, broken teeth of the rotting animatronic. Hudson tried to shift in preparation for standing without moving his wrist. It didn't work. He had to move his left arm to get his right arm in position to push himself into an upright position. Uh, the pain brought it with a wave of nausea. 
Hudson bent over, but the sound of the animatronic taking another clicking step forced him to move again. Nearly hyperventilating, Hudson stood, his back to the wall. Behind him, hands and arms brushed against his shoulder braces, uh, braces? Blades. He quickly stepped away from the wall, and he almost lost his balance. His legs felt weak. He was swaying like a sapling in the wind. He looked at the rolling pin lying on the ground. He couldn't bend over to get to it. Move, he told himself. You've got to move. He made himself look at the advancing animatronic, and that's when he saw the knife. The knife got him to move. The animatronic was only a couple feet from the knife. Hudson had to get to it first. Lunging forward, ignoring the pain in his wrist, Hudson was able to snatch up the knife just before the animatronic reached it. He took a step back and brandished the knife ahead of him. The animatronic kept advancing. Hudson took another step back and waved the knife through the air. The animatronic's pace didn't falter. Hudson swung the knife wildly, back and forth. Uh, and back and forth. The animatronic was on him, reaching for him, clawing at him, and suddenly the knife blade sliced through Hudson's bicep. Hudson screamed, turned, and ran as scorching pain erupted in his arm. Warmth trickled down his bicep, through the crook of his elbow, and from his forearm to his injured wrist. Nothing divided in half is nothing, Lewis's voice called out behind Hudson. Hudson nearly tripped and fell. How could he have forgotten? Lewis, the real Lewis, had said that very thing to him when Lewis had slashed Hudson with a knife just before the fire. The knife was the reason the fire happened. Why had Hudson suppressed that memory? It didn't matter now. Nothing mattered except getting away from the robot corpse thing that was after him. He forced himself to move down the hall, but his steps faltered and he had to grab the wall for support. One of the animatronic mouths bit his right forearm and he screamed, once again moving away from the wall. He had to get out of this hallway. He started running, stumbling, staggering, weaving, but trying to stay in the centre of the hall. Every jarring step was pain-filled, but he kept going. Reaching the far corner of the hallway, Hudson looked over his shoulder to see how close his pursuer was. He slid to a stop. No one was behind him. The hallway was empty and its walls were still. Well, it wasn't completely empty. A bloody but uh, butcher knife lay on the floor near where Hudson was when the animatronic slashed him. Or did it? Had he imagined it? He looked down at his arm. He sure hadn't imagined that. A sickingly wide gap in his skin ran from his upper bicep to just above his elbow. Blood was still gushing co copi copiously, <laughs> copiously down his arm over his busted wrist and dripping off his fingers. He had to stop the bleeding. He started to put his right hand over the wound, but he paused. Why was his right hand bloody? He hadn't touched the wound yet. It was bloody like it had been splashed with blood when it slashed. No, he did not slash himself, did he? Hudson shook his head several times and concentrated on how he was going to stop the bleeding in his arm. He'd used up all his first aid supplies on his head wound. Wavering on his feet, Turning to look around him every two seconds, crying and unable to stop, Hudson tried to think, what should he do? As he watched the flow of the blood, he realised it wouldn't flow as fast if the arm wasn't hanging down. So he lifted his arm, but he'd forgotten about his wrist, again. The broken bones under the skin ground together as they rotated and he screeched in pain. He tried to raise his arm above the level of his heart, but the pain wouldn't let him. Panicking because he was starting to feel weak, Hudson tore the wrap off his injured head and awkwardly tried to re-situate it around his upper arm. There wasn't enough material to cover the entire wound. Material. Of course, he could use the towels from the gift shop, and then he could break the front doors of the building and get out of here. Hudson had to get to the lobby, fast. Once again, surveying the hall to be sure he was alone and not under attack by the walls, Hudson looked as fast as he could toward the lobby. Every step jolted his wrist, and he had to fight the nausea that wanted him to sit down and stop moving. Keep going, he told himself. Keep going. Don't stop again. But nearly at the end of the hall, he did stop. He'd forgotten the rolling pin. He looked back down the hall. The rolling pin was gone. And where was his nightstick and the hammer? The last he'd seen them was in the hands reaching from the wall. Moaning, Hudson stared at the spot on the floor where he was sure he'd left the wooden utensil. He willed it to be there, but it wasn't. 
Hudson whimpered and turned his back on what he couldn't explain. He staggered forward again. Concentrating, he willed his feet to keep moving. As he passed Pirate's Cove, Hudson told himself he was halfway there. Just keep going, he ordered himself. But then he stopped. He stopped in horror when the purple curtain around Pirate's Cove began ripping in half, torn from the inside from uh, Foxy's pirate hook. Hudson gaped at what uh, he was seeing. Was this happening, or had this exhibit's animation been completed without his knowledge? As Hudson began shuffling away from Pirate's Cove, the curtain was wrenched apart, and the deformed rabbit animatronic peered out at Hudson. It raised its arm, and Hudson could see the rabbit held a foxy arm. It was the rabbit that had been slashing the curtain. Hudson ran. Several feet down the hall, he checked over his shoulder. He wasn't being chased, but he didn't slow down. He had to get to the towels to stop his bleeding. At least there was one good thing about the animatronic being behind him. It wouldn't be hanging in the inner hall, which Hudson realised he'd have to pass through to get to the lobby. Squaring his shoulders, he forged ahead, turning down the hall where the animatronic was hanging at the start of the... The animatronic was hanging on the wall, just where Barry and Duane left it. How did it get back here? Watching the horrible robotic character, Hudson shuffled past as fast as he could. The animatronic didn't move. Hudson checked it several times after he passed it, but it kept hanging there, silent, still. Finally, he concentrated on getting to his destination. He was almost there, but every step he took, he felt weaker. He couldn't walk in a straight line, and his sight was getting a little blurry. Determined, he worked his way down the long hall and made the turn toward the lobby. It took longer to get there than it should have, but he got there. Unfortunately, the shop was mostly dark. Lights from the lobby barely reached the space. They provided only enough illumination to create amorphous shapes. Stumbling into the darkened space, Hudson used his right hand to feel along the shelves. He groped for the textiles he knew were here. Feeling fur, he made his way past the plushies and action figures. Hey, did something nip at him? No, he was just imagining things, which was understandable given what he'd experienced this evening. He kept going and he finally found the towels. He grabbed a stack of them and started wrapping them around his arm. When they wouldn't stay, he felt around when he found the Chica headbands uh, he remembered were here. Uh, he... Oh, right, yeah. Sorry, I was very confused with that sentence. He used those to tie the towels in place. It was an awkward and painful process. He had to keep moving his arm to position the towels and the bands, and every time he did, his wrist protected him in blazing, um, in blazing blasts of pain. He gritted his teeth, hissed out his breath, and kept working on wrapping his arm. Finally, he finished. Now for the front door. Still weak, but encouraged by the process he'd made, uh, Hudson thought about what was in the gift shop. What could he use to break the glass door? Sporting goods. Hadn't he seen a baseball bat in here? Hudson took a step forward, where he thought he'd find a bat, but a loud fluttering sound stopped him. He squinted into the darkness. He saw movement. What was that? He couldn't tell, but he could tell the movement was advancing his way. He backed out of the gift shop. He was nearly out of the gift shop when he smelled something that made him throw up all over the floor. He couldn't help it. It was a reflex. He smelled black cherry pipe tobacco. And now he smelled the acidic stench of vomit. You gonna mess your room, boy? <laughs> Lewis bellowed. You can just stay there and breathe it in. Hudson wa wavered on his feet, staring in amuse uh, um, sorry, not amusement, amazement, while Lewis stormed around his room and gathered every toy Hudson had ever owned. Piling them, lining them up, Lewis created a barrier at the doorway of Hudson's room. Live in the sink, little boy, Lewis growled. Trying not to breathe through his nose, Hudson turned to his bed. But his bed wasn't there. He wasn't in his room. He was outside the gift shop. Breathing through his nose, he took a step into the lobby. He had to get to the front doors. But what happened next wasn't the way he'd planned to do it. Hudson was suddenly lifted off the floor and up into the air. Then he was thrown across the lobby. Somehow, as he flew into the air, Hudson was flipped over. He hit the wall on the opposite side of the lobby with his back and a disturbing crunch and more pain than his mind was able to fathom. He slid to the floor, landing on his left side, on his slashed arm with and broken wrist. The initial impact felt just like it had when Lewis had thrown him onto a wall, but the aftermath was worse. When did Lewis do that? Was it before or after the barrier of toys? Hudson couldn't remember. Where was he now? Was he in his past? 
Or was he in the present? He didn't know. All he knew was pain. Hudson bellowed at the top of his lungs. Then he panted like a dog. Was this the same injury, a new one? If it was new, had the fused discs held? Hudson couldn't tell. His back was a radiating pulsation of pain. He lay still, afraid to ask anything else of his battered body. As he lay on his side, breathing shallowly, um, he tried to check his surroundings. Was Lewis still in his room? Was the rabbit animatronic going to show up again? He craned his neck to look all over the lobby. He saw nothing out of place. No, wait, something was out of place. On the wall above him, a large vent cover was hanging by one screw. The cover was swinging slowly. The dark passage it had concealed, now wide open to anyone or anything. Could the animatronic have thrown him and then retreated into the vent? The sickly scent of cherry pipe tobacco hung in the air again. He had to get away from the horror in this building. Gingerly moving his legs, which made his back kink up in a stiff protest, Hudson tried to get in a position so he could stand. No matter how much it hurt, he couldn't just lie here and let the animatronic or whatever was tormenting him make its next move. He needed to get to the doors. Hudson turned to look toward them. He gasped. No way. No freaking way. He blinked, rubbed his eyes with his right hand and looked again. Yes, he was seeing what he was seeing. The doors were being guarded by the gift shop's entire supply of plushies and action figures. They were lined up and poised for action, and they were all watching him. Hudson stood and screamed. Oh god, this is creepy. His back felt like it was being torn in half. His wrist felt like it was filled with ground glass. His arm was pounding uh, out a staccato beat of intense, tortuous pain. He couldn't take much more. He had to hide. But where? He looked up and down the hall, stretching away from the lobby, and his gaze landed on the kitchen doorway at the far end of the left hall. Holding his breath, he took a step in that direction. He knew where he could go. Heat purges. He could hear Granny's voice in his head. Fire heals. The fireplace. He'd be safe in the fireplace. Lewis couldn't reach him there. Heat purges. Fire heals. Using these two phrases as a mantra, Hudson began shuffling toward the kitchen. Each step was a new ev elevation of the pain. Each of his footfalls made him wonder if he'd make it. When he asked himself if he'd make it, he told himself, heat purges, fire heals. Oh, wait. He's going to set the place on fire. He's going to set the place on fire. Because it's Fazbear's Fright. It, it, this, is, this is definitely where this, is, this story is going. He's going to set the place on fire and, and die. Uh, he didn't mean the words literally. He had no intention of heating anything or setting fire to anything. Oh, wait. <laughs> oh, but the words had reminded him of where he could hide. The words seemed to control his feet, so they, uh, so they kept moving towards Hudson's destination. When he reached it, he stood in front of it and smiled. He wondered why he hadn't thought of this before. Hudson reached out with his right hand and tugged on one of the industrial oven doors. As soon as it opened, he gingerly climbed inside the oven. There he sat, stretched out his legs, and grabbed the door. He pulled it closed with a satisfying whoomp. Finally, he was safe. Or was he? As he huddled against the hard, cold walls uh, of the oven, Hudson's mind went black. Uh, back sorry, once again to the past. Safe was what he thought he was the night he wrestled the knife from Lewis and threatened the man with it. Leave me alone, he'd screamed. Never touch me again. Well, I'll tell everyone everything. Lewis had laughed at him. Kid, you're not going to tell anyone anything. They'll think they know what they need to know. And with that strange sta statement, Lewis had disappeared into the kitchen and Hudson had crawled into the fireplace to hide. The next thing Hudson knew, there was a fire in the fireplace and then the house was on fire. Hudson barely got out alive. The burns on his legs left him with the nerve damage that had barred him away from the Navy. He didn't set the fire, did he? He told everyone he didn't set it because he believed he didn't. A popping sound yanked Hudson from his re rev... Rever referee. <laughs> I don't know what that is. What was that? He listened. Wait, so you know how how he, um Faith uh he t he was Faith was like, did you do it? So I'm assuming the thing that he in like inverted commas that he did was set the fire in the house. Huh. Okay. I see where this is going. And he heard a rustling sound and a snap. 
Hudson hunched over in the fireplace and he listened for Lewis as he looked at Lewis's lighter. When had Hudson taken it? He didn't remember, but it was his now. Hudson could feel Lewis's lighter in his hand. He could feel his thumb on the little starter wheel. Flames started crawling up the curtains next to the fireplace. In the oven, something whirred, then made a little spitting sound. Hudson heard a concussive burst like a backdraft, blowing open a door. He looked down at his empty hands. The cool walls of the oven started warming up. Hudson shot away from the oven walls. No! Panicked, Hudson kicked at the oven door. It didn't budge. Open the door, he shouted. He kicked again. The door remained closed. Oh, Hudson, a voice said. It was Granny Foster. Huh? Okay. Hudson looked around the oven and tried to see out through the thick glass opening in the door. He couldn't see anyone. Granny, get me out of here, Hudson yelled. Oh, Hudson, Granny's voice repeated. Her voice wasn't coming from outside the oven. It was inside with Hudson. The oven got hotter. Hudson started to sweat. Help me! Hudson heard what sounded like a sigh rushing through the oven. Your path is your path, Granny's voice said. And the oven got hotter and hotter. I am so confused. <laughs> I'm, there's three pages left. Where can this go? I'm so confused. Okay. Okay. You know what I'm going to miss most when we start training? Dwayne asked Barry as the two men climbed the steps to the front of Fazbear's Frights. What? Barry pulled out his keys and unlocked the front doors. He was a little surprised he had to do that. Usually Hudson was down here already unlocking the doors. Your grandma's cooking, Dwayne said. Barry laughed, then sobered. I would have said that too, until I met Faith. That'll work out, Dwayne said as they stepped into the building. Where's Hudson? Barry asked. Hudson? Dwayne called. What's that smell? Barry wrinkled up his face. Dwayne covered his nose. Smells like something burning. Hey, did you hear about the fire at the circus? What? It was intense. Oh, I... D <laughs> oh, come on! Come on! I, I thought he was going to talk about the Circus Baby's Pizza War. <laughs> uh, it was intense. Duane laughed loudly. Get it? I in Intense? Barry shook his head. Hudson, he called. They waited, breathing shallowly. No one answered. Let's go check the office, Barry said. The men headed down the main hall. They looked around as they went. Everything was the same as it had been when they left the night before. Same stacks of boxes, same animatronic they took to the wall. Dwayne bent over. I forgot to pick up this tooth last night. We can glue it back in. They went down the hall and leaned into the open door of the office. It looked normal too, but Hudson wasn't in it. Where the heck is he? Dwayne asked. Barry shook his head. Dwayne laughed. Maybe he finally got smart and left this crummy town. That wouldn't be a bad thing, Barry said. I'd miss him, but he could use a fresh start. Dwayne made a face. The smell is stronger down here. It's coming from the kitchen, I think. Barry said, let's go check it out. As the two headed toward the kitchen, Barry said, I feel for Hudson. Poor guy deserves to have something go right. Ha, huh. okay, okay. I'm confused. <laughs> I'm very confused. Oh, uh, what? What? I'm so confused. Oh my god. You know, everybody used to say like, oh, the FNAF lore is, is confusing. That was before the Fazbear Frights books came out. And I was like, okay, yeah, it's, it's pretty confusing, but at least it's kind of like consistent, you know, kind of consistent. I mean, there is a few inconsistencies, but hey ho. Then all of these stories started came, coming out and now I'm completely lost with everything. <laughs> like everything I thought I knew about the FNAF universe just doesn't work anymore. Um, what is this? I don't get it. I, I don't. So I, I'm assuming he did. He was he was actually in the oven at Fazbear Frights and he burnt up and he heard his grand's voice. I don't get that part. I don't get the parts where like Lewis's voice he could hear and his, his grand's voice he could hear. I don't get all of that. I don't understand. Is it like hallucinations? Is it like like in FNAF 3 with like the phantom animatronics and like hallucinating and stuff? Is it something like that? 
I really don't know. I'm really confused. The the animatronic was clearly Springtrap. I mean, we can all agree with that, right? Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I honestly have no idea how all of these different things tie together. Um, but also, also, I heard um, rumours that this story was supposed to be evidence for a uh, Mike victim. Wait, no, was it Mike Trap? No, it was Mike Victim, I think. Either way, I don't really get why. <laughs> you guys are going to have to maybe explain in the comments, but I hope you enjoyed the audiobook. Um, this was this was a blast. Um, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just baffled at how confused I am. Oh, God. Okay, well, thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you do enjoy these audiobooks, then make sure you subscribe so that you see more when they come out. Next time, we are going to be doing the... Uh, well, not about the authors. Uh, we are going to be doing the next uh, Stitch Wraith thingy, and it's only 39 pages long, so it'll probably be... Yeah. Yeah, I, I, actually, this I'm really excited for this Stitch Wraith because um, I really, I really want to see where this goes. Anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Goodbye.